Coming to you from UBN Studios in Burbank, California. You're listening to the Unsugarcoated Podcast with your host, Ali Alanius. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to another amazing season of your favorite social good podcast, Unsugarcoated with Alia. I know we had a little bit longer of a break in our hiatus than we intended to, but thank you for being patient with us. You know, as always, it is production. Things happen. But we're back. We're back with another incredible season for you. Uh, can I, cannot wait for you to hear all of our guests throughout the season coming up. We have uh, Dr. M- Matthew Knowles, Beyonce's father. We have our guest today, Dr. Calvin Sun. We have um, just a... I, Yes, of course, right now I have not had enough coffee. My brain is blanking. I'm going to be content, <laughs> but it's amazing. I'm so sorry. Okay, so um, what we're going to do today is uh, have a very interesting talk. It's, we're definitely doing our theme, this theme, this season, unsugarcoated, but like for real unsugarcoated. What is the unsugarcoated media movement about? It is about being authentic uh, and yet being really candid for the betterment of society. It's not being unsugarcoated to hurt people's feelings or or to impose my belief or our beliefs on others you know what we're about we want you living the most resilient amazing life that you possibly can be especially if you happen to identify as a survivor of trauma not because we want to sit in what that means but we want to you know focus on what we can do to make our lives better live the best life that we possibly can because that's important right it's important to me I'm certain it's important to you um, a couple announcements really quick let me say this in January quick shout out to my amazing husband Joseph Lanius as you guys may remember we were just just in Venice, Italy, in August for the premiere of The Card Counter uh, that with Oscar Isaac, Tiffany Haddish, Obama just recently the other day considered that one of his top movies of 2021. So whether you like Obama or not, I really don't care. When you get a man of his stature to like your movie, uh, it's a good thing, right? So I like, I like his taste in movies is what I'm saying, guys. Now we just got the announcement. We can finally announce Sundance Film Festival, his next film coming out, Call Jane with Elizabeth Banks, Sigourney Weaver. It's on women's rights during a very contentious time in our legal system when Roe v. Wade is actually literally up uh, for conversation and potentially a, a huge turn, which would greatly impact everyone in this country, to be quite honest. So whether you realize that or not. But we're not going to talk about that subject necessarily. I do just want to give a shout out. My husband continues to do amazing things in this industry. I love how he picks films. You know, Card Counter was mental health. Uh, uh, Call Jane is women's rights. We continue. We continue. And when people want to know how we're doing those things, man, let me tell you, we work hard and we work smart because that's definitely part of the formula. So stay tuned for more news on that front. And uh, yeah, so hope, don't forget to support unsugarcoatedmedia.com. If you want to buy our sweatshirts, we have our books, we have stuff. There's plenty of ways to support us as an organization. And yeah, I think that's about it on announcements for now. Um, so let's get it to it, right? We're going to be talking today about va- the vaccination. Uh, you know, largely over the course of the pandemic, I choose when to talk about COVID, not because I'm trying to pretend it doesn't exist, but because I know that from time to time we we want to talk about other things. What are the other areas of our lives, right? It, it, COVID is not the end all be all. No differently than cancer didn't define me as a patient. Um, it was a journey that I went through, that I learned from, and I overcame. I see COVID in generally the same way. So, but when I when it comes to the vaccination, the reason why I feel that this conversation is so important and critical is because there is this divide, this division of the vaxxed versus the unvaxxed. That narrative becomes very dangerous for our society, for our families, and that that matters to me because as people who have already gone through a lot in our life, we don't need to add more. You don't need to add more death. You don't need to add more isolation and struggle to yourself. Um, And I'm definitely opposed to the narrative being creative that we need to be pitted against each other. So let me preface this entire conversation with you. Whether you are vaccinated or not, I still care about you as an individual. I still want to see you living your best life. If you hear a conversation today and you say, you know, I still don't want to get vaccinated, I'm not going to be like, oh my God, I'm done with you. I don't ever want to touch this because that's not, you know, I know how that feels. Uh, I just want to share a quick story. When I was going through my issues with my health, they told me you need to have a hysterectomy. I didn't want to be go into surgery and have, you know, my lady parts taken away. I didn't, 
you know, I, I was being told things. I didn't want to go for chemotherapy. I didn't want to do certain things. But you know what? I wanted to do more than that. I wanted to live. So when you when it comes to weighing our options and sometimes what we should do versus what we want to do, that's part of the conversation, guys. So, you know, please keep that in mind uh, because we're not trying to convince you to get, you know, one way or the other. But I do want you to be educated. So, you know, that matters. Um, I've had I've been an observer of many conversations regarding the vaccination and I hear people don't trust the government. Uh, this is a conspiracy by the government to kill off, you know, a large portion of our population. Uh, it's a vaccine that just came out. You know, it, we're, we're in literally living clinical trials right now and, and all these different uh, parts of the conversation. Then there's another one. We live in a free society and I shouldn't have to do anything I don't want to do. Well, I have to tell you, as a person who knows very well that that's actually not true we live in a democratic society by that is what i mean what i mean is i'm born into the united states if i want to go somewhere i have to have a passport i have to have a driver's license there are laws i can't go past a certain speed i have to put a seat belt on when i get in the car i have to uh, stop at the red light when i'm told to or else i'm gonna get a ticket my children are mine so long as i do what i'm supposed to do the minute a CPS agent or CPS worker thinks I'm not, they will come remove your kids or threaten you to. Um, if you've been in, in the military, you would know that you can't do anything without permission of the government because you no longer belong to yourself. In fact, you can't even get liposuction if you're in the military unless you have permission from your commanding officer. Because once again, you know, this concept that we live in a free society you know, it's not actually as true as you think. If you've ever been through the legal system, you know, if you've ever been criminally and your freedom has been taken away from you, uh, you know, also, once again, we, we, we exist in a democratic society, but in a society where there are rules and regulations so that we are hopefully serving our communities to the best of our ability. Right? Right? Okay, can we agree on that? Um, because... You know, even with the vaccinations, I can't send my children. I'm kind of used to the whole legal vaccinations because my children in California, and I can only speak to where I live, in California since 2015, whether you had a personal or a, a personal or a religious exemption, you have to have your children vaccinated with certain vaccines or they will not be able to attend school. So, you know, this is just some of the parts. Maybe you're a person who doesn't have a child, so you're not familiar with that concept. But me, in my stage in life, after, you know, like I said, having I've been through the criminal system when I was 18. Y'all have heard my story. I've had CPS show up on my doorstep, not because I was a bad parent, because but that's just the kind of society we live in. I've I've had to take medications I don't want to take because I know that I have to in order to stay to be here chilling with y'all. Right. So so hopefully that's OK. All right, so now I'm going to bring on my guest because I can't wait to have him as part of this conversation. He's been on our show before. He was with us in spring of 2020, educating us on COVID itself and his powerful story, why he does it. You know, I want you to know why this man gets up every day and does what he does. And we're going to hear about his own personal journey with the vaccinations as a person and as a professional. And yes, Omicron is here. So what are we going to, you know, what are some of the travel things that we, you know, we're headed into the holidays? What are some of the things we should be observing? But ultimately, as always, guys, we just want to bring value to you, truly and 100%. So remember that. All right. With that, let me get to our guest and bring him on. Dr. Calvin Sun is a practicing and board certified emergency medicine physician and clinical assistant professor in emergency medicine, a public speaker, phlebographer, activist, choreographer, and entrepreneur based in New York City. Graduating from Columbia University and SUNY Downstate College, SUNY, excuse me, Downstate College of Medicine, respectively, as vice president and president of his classes, Dr. Sun is also the founder and CEO of the Monsoon Diaries, a blog turned travel community that has taken hundreds of readers to 200 plus countries and territories in the past 10 years, including North Korea, Nauru, Iraq, and Antarctica. The Monsoon Diaries has since been featured on BBC News, ABC News, MSNBC, TED, National Geographic, and USA Today. Dr. Sun has most recently been notable for his firsthand reporting on the 2020 coronavirus pandemic in New York City emergency rooms and has since been invited back to numerous shows to educate people on COVID and return 
returning to Unsugar Coated with Alia. Everyone, please give Dr. Sun a warm welcome back. Welcome back, Dr. Sun. What's up, what's it's up? good to be back. Always happy to be here. It's so good to see you. I, I really appreciate your time and when you come on, I know you're doing incredible, incredible things. Let me ask you, let me actually qu quickly ask you, you know, how did you get into medicine? I lost a bet while bartending. <laughs> and one thing led to another where it got me into traveling, which I didn't realize I liked and enjoyed until I lost the bet. And that led me to make another bet. And I got into medical school to my surprise. And I didn't want to give up on the opportunity that most people would kill for. Uh, and I just kept doing it without knowing where I was going to go and where it was going to lead me until here I am. Just, you know, like Forrest Gump running around the country after Jenny Dumpson for the third time, fourth time, fifth time. I don't know, point, point in the movie, but he just keeps running and it just things just happen uh, because he's committed to the present. Uh, and yeah, I just go with the flow and see where it leads me. And, um, you know, flying by the seat of my pants, never plan. It's really, I don't even know I'm doing five minutes from now or I'm worth talking about five minutes from now. I just trust in uh, the process and always, you know, commit 100% to where I am uh, in the moment. I love that. I love that. It kind of reminds me of my husband. People say, because he was a, he was going to be a DJ. He was going to be a rock star DJ. And then he finally got to a point, he flipped a coin. It was law school or MBA. And he ended up landing on law school. So I love it. It seems to work out. Uh, so let me ask you, you know, and, and I do want to let the audience know, you work as an emergency physician. We'll talk more a bit about that. But you also, like you said, you you travel as a physician. You you work the Maris, you know, New York City Marathon, which, um, you know, these, these huge events. But let me ask you, what gets you up every day to do what you do for a living? When it or, but when it comes to the being a physician, what is it? What's your drive? It's funny if you asked me that question like 10 years ago before I became a doctor. Like, I think right around the time I applied to medical school. 10, 11 years ago, uh, I didn't have much experience behind me. Just, you know, that the answer would be just excitement for the unknown. Um, being, I've created a, a habit of being comfortable with the uncomfortable after, you know, our shared traumas. So what, that's how we reframe traumas. My dad died when I was young from a sudden heart attack. Uh, my mom was sick uh, and couldn't take care of me that summer, same summer. My partner broke up with me it's really quickly, or like after the, my father's funeral. And reframing that, and you know, obviously, I can choose to you know, not reframe it, not reframe it, frame it as something like, oh, it, you know, that's just you know, my luck, or reframe it as this is the opportunity to do better, to see this as you know, an, an impetus to, or a motivation to you know, live my own life on my own terms, because you can't control for things that are out of your control. And so, 10, 11 years ago, I didn't know I want to be a doctor. I, was you know just wanted to be a bartender and just what got me every up every uh, morning was you know the excitement of losing a bet and then all of a sudden finding myself in Egypt 36 hours later with a girl I had just met at the bar and saying who are you uh I just met you 36 hours ago in New York and things like that led me to apply to med school because how do I know I'm not meant to be a doctor unless I do it you know I didn't know I like traveling unless I did it and you know I, I was very honest about my insecurities about being a doctor and I think one med school really loved that honesty and took me I mean, I did get through the back door and I was an imposter <laughs> and he even reaff reaffirmed that. But, you know, one thing at a time where I, beca I became so comfortable with being uncomfortable, that's what got me through that excitement. Now, with that, all that experience behind me and knowing that it's been working out consistently, then the answer is purpose. I wake up every morning knowing that I have an opportunity to have and fulfill my sense of purpose and uh, I can go home every night, go to bed uh, with a sense of fulfillment that I made a difference every day because I committed to the present. So that's a long answer to your short question. No, but I love it. And I find it really quite inspirational and, and honest because that is part of the process, you know, and, and, you know, it makes me, I want my audience to know because you, you're very vulnerable. You know, you share the blog, blogging that you did, the flow blogger, you know, you share these amazing photos and, and the community that you're building and then on top of it, you have this other side of healthcare. You know, you took this oath to take care of people. So I want to make sure I mention because for you, the pandemic was it wasn't just an, a job. There was also a personal aspect. And I remember you shared last time that you had lost your grandfather, and 
you know, in lot in some, you know, people please go back and watch that episode, but ultimately he didn't listen to you, you know. And we've we've had this nearly two years of a pandemic, right? We're going on twenty January twenty twenty two is when re- people really started to even hear about the coronavirus or this thing. Uh, what to you still remains a frustration or, you know, one of the most difficult part, parts as a physician at, at this day and age or at this time? It's a multifactorial answer uh, to such a complicated question. I don't let things frustrate me because I can only help the people that want to be helped. But to get to that conclusion so I can keep moving requires a little bit of frustration. But it's a conclusion so that I can move on from the frustration so it doesn't bog me down because I choose my battles. I cannot help the people that don't want to be helped. That means I am frustrated by those who don't want the help. And unfortunately, that multifactorial part of, you know, answering that question in context of a pandemic is that people who don't want to help can be hurting and being and be unhelpful in an active sense to all of society, because if you get infected unvaccinated, you will have more uh, unvaccinated cells to, you know, create a new variant. And that's why we're in this situation right now where this constant cycle of usually it's an unvaccinated uh, even more like an immunocompromised person where you just don't have enough uh, ability of your body to fight with the help of, uh, you know, those pesky vaccine antibodies to prevent a virus from replicating, trying to do different mutant strains to create a new variant, which is, you know, why we're here now. A vaccinated person is very unlikely to create a new mutant variant strain. It's just, it's just not impossible. It doesn't make sense. It's they, they go, they basically, you might as well believe that aliens will abduct you the next day. Um, hey, well, I mean, we don't know. Maybe those are the same kind of people, but frustrating, right? right. But you know, we need to only really focus on what we can do because it would, we, you know, not even, you know, God pleases everyone, right? It, or change it can everything. You know, it's it's not a perfect society, so we have to make do and do our best uh, and reach it, be as perfect as possible. You know, within our control. I agree. I That's agree. frustrating too. Yeah, yeah. It's not enough. <laughs> you know, so. let's talk about the healthcare system a bit. Um, the dangers, I think, a lot of people often forget. Uh, especially when, with the words, whenever it comes with the fear of a lockdown, right? Or what actually really is a huge concern, aside from naturally people just dying unnecessarily. We've had, uh, is well, excuse me, one of the dangers is that so many people will become sick at the same time that our healthcare system cannot take care of that many people, right? Like LA, for example, I think over the greater Los Angeles area, counting everything is 10 million people. We do not have enough resources nor hospital beds if everybody gets sick at the same time. So with share with us your observation, because I know for you, you've been traveling, you know, you, you travel through different, you're not contracted, so you get to move around to different hospitals, putting you in different healthcare settings, seeing their different policies, seeing their different staff and how they're running. Share with us, if you can, what, is, what have been some of your observations for the healthcare work, workers right now? Oh, right now is just resigned uh, exasperation, uh, but you know, we're not completely hopeless because we have a vaccine and henceforth a, a working seatbelt. Last year and a half ago, a year and a half ago, we had a lockdown because there were no vaccines, there were no seatbelts. So if you're telling me that someone just invented the car, it you know, and we're driving down this highway of life. Uh, but, you know, we haven't had seatbelts yet and everyone's crashing to everyone because, you know, not everyone knows how to drive on a highway because the car was just invented. Car feels great. Life is great. You know, it seems great. You know, just the highway is, seems like open and free, but then people are crashing and you're telling me everyone's crashing. Well, you know, we, we only walk as slow as our slowest walker. I want to be able to drive as fast as possible, but I can't, can I? Because Sally, you know, drove at 90 miles per hour and killed a family of 20 you know, in the 10 car, you know, pile up on their way to the, the, the theme park. So we have to now take a step back and pause. Like, can we all just wait until we get seat belts and traffic lights and figure out this whole system before we cause more car accidents or drive slower? Don't drive as fast as Sally did. Um, but no, I don't want to. I really want to drive as fast as possible. It's not my fault Sally, you know, drove as fast as she wanted while drunk. Uh, maybe we should check into that. Maybe you shouldn't, you know, text and drive or drink and drive. And that's why we had a lockdown because we didn't have any seatbelts. So people were just dying, um, whatever, you know, driving however they wanted. 
now, you know, you have, you still have car accidents. I mean, seatbelts don't prevent car accidents. They don't prevent natural disasters. They don't prevent the weather. They don't prevent inclement weather. If the roads get icy, people crash. But at least seatbelts prevent us from being hospitalized, having long-term disability or dying when there's a crash. It doesn't prevent the crash. So there's a little hopefulness uh, involved where like, okay, we can drive. Um, people should still drive responsibly, uh, but now we have a vaccine or a seatbelt so that in case things that happen that are out of our control, okay, we talked about that at the beginning of the back end, when things happen that are out of our control, at least we know we did our best and we tried to reach perfection as much as possible, which can be frustrating because sometimes that's still not good enough and people still can get sick. Uh, just like people can still die in a car accident while wearing a seatbelt. Doesn't mean that you don't get into a car without a seatbelt still. Seatbelts kill people. Airbags, you see like literally in every car, they have a little picture that had kills like young children in the front seat. But yet we still don't get into a car without a working seatbelt and airbags, even though they kill way more people than a vaccine does. We don't get on an airplane unless they have working seatbelts, even though when a plane goes down, what is that seatbelt really gonna do, you know, by and large, we still put it on. Absolutely, absolutely. And interestingly enough, Dr. Sun, I know I'm a little bit older than you. So I remember when you didn't have to have a seatbelt on. I remember when people were so angry that you had, to, you know, like that was a whole new thing. I, I was part of that generation of people who drove around with no seat. Heck, my mom used to put me and my little brother in the same seat with one seatbelt across our belts, you know. I, I know, you know, and I saw society's reaction then. And then I remember the car makers had to make it part of the car. I don't know if you remember that. It was like this electric one. And that was the start of seatbelts of people yeah. understanding this is something that's good for you. This is something that is, is going to make a, a, and it has, it has led to less deaths in car accidents. I like that you bring it up though, because uh, one of the things is like when I was vaccinated and I'm going to share my own personal va uh, journey for the, for the audience, I didn't want to get vaccinated. I was nervous, you know, like, okay, look, I, I'm one of those people. I don't even like to get the first software update, right? I'm like, let everyone else get it and let's see how that works out. And I'll get the one that doesn't have the bugs or I get the one that has all the bugs worked out. Our mind tells us that don't be the first in line for anything, right? Well, you were one of the first in line. You know, I, we have some pictures you've shared with, uh, you know, you've shared very candidly with your audience out there. You, you know, you've let people see when you've got the booster, and, you know, I was I was always told just because you get the vaccine, Alia, which a this is what my doctor said, you could get it and you could survive. You could get it and die on paper. You're not the one we want getting it. So choice is yours. But when you're when I'm weighing my life as one of the like, hmm, live or die, I think I'm going to take the one that, you know, so I ended up taking it. But he did say now you can still get covid. The hope is, though, you won't die. So can you please, you know, from your perspective, share, because, you know, look, as, as of status, as of November 22nd, 2021 was when I checked that, you know, at least 770,000 people have been, you know, counted as dying from COVID in the U.S. Um, you know, yeah, like why was it that was so important for you to share your journey with being vaccinated with your, you know, community? Oh, I mean, that's my habit. I like I've been writing a diary since I was like six years old. I would share like whenever I had a girl over at middle school and high school, I'm like, hey, read my diary or write in it. Uh, I'm an open book, literally, but I do write all my feelings down because that's how I dealt with trauma. I had a really tough childhood. So the only way to, you know, get it out naturally that made me feel good was write and, and you know, happy and share with other people. Who am I? What am I to lose? Uh, I have nothing to hide. I have you know, felt better by sharing. And it was something like I just developed over time. So, you know, why did I share, you know, how I got vaccinated? It's kind of like when you start Instagram and shared your lunch and what you had to lunch. Eventually that, you know, dies over time. And, you know, you don't want to share your lunch with all the time because it's just the novelty wears off. But then you start sharing other things that are important in your life, you know, you know, new relationships or, you know, but serendipities, new travel plans. And sharing the fact that I got vaccinated was as easy as sharing the fact that I was in a new country. I'm traveling so really that's an honest answer it's just like a you know hey you know i got a new apartment or i moved in uh it's just as innocuous as that um but the you know because i don't go in with expectations other than for myself to know that i did something important to myself what it ended up becoming was uh without that expectation just like the forest cup right around the country right it, it inspired and reassured countless people in my communities and elsewhere to get vaccinated as well and that that 
was the the effect of something I did for myself, then that's even better, a bonus. I mean, I only do things really like Forrest Gump runs for himself. He just felt like running. I felt like getting vaccinated. Uh, I felt like sharing that. Forrest Gump was on TV when he ran around the country and he was okay with sharing that. And all of a sudden people started following him and running with him because they feel like he's inspired them somehow and that he's got it all figured out. I mean, he, he invented the smiley face. I, mean, I know this is all you know fiction, but and really the attitude is something that we can identify with. Like you just, in the intention is you really just should do things because you want to take care of yourself and do what's best for yourself. And if you do that honestly and genuinely without any sense of bias, then other people will follow suit because it's that energy that, that draws people to know like, well, he's living his best life. I want to as well. And, you know, as long as you're not imposing it on the people, forcing it on other people, it's even more effective. And that's what translates to like the vaccines. Like, I've never been a doctor to tell you you should do this or you should do that. I'm not trained that way. I mean, plenty of doctors are paternalistic. Um, I come from a generation where I was trained. It's just the fact of the schools I went to and the training programs. When we guide the patient through something they don't understand that well, and hopefully they choose. Patient autonomy is one of the pillars of medicine. And we if we celebrate that. We encourage that the patient chooses his, the, the decision, whether it's to get take a medicine or get vaccinated. They have the autonomy to know that they own the decision. If you force it on them, they're going to resent you. Obviously, I'm not a public health politician, official person who's paid to like make, you know, sweeping mandates, you know, because that's not my job. I'm not trained in that. Uh, and I understand that where they're coming from because you want to, you know, do the best for everyone. But, you know, in my work, in, in you're asking me as Calvin Sun and what I do is patient autonomy. I want people to arrive on their own. Um, but, you know, if I can do that by showing them that I did it, then that's a win-win. I do it for myself. I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not pushing that on anyone. And hopefully they're inspired to do the same thing for themselves. If they choose not to, then they have to suffer the consequences of choosing not to. You just have to also tell them, okay, you if you don't want to, you have to willing to suffer the consequences when you go home unvaccinated and grandma dies because of you. If you're okay with that, if you're at her funeral and say, yep, I killed her, then that's then we know that's you. I don't have to hang out with people like you because you know I have enough friends that don't want to kill grandma and want to do everything they can as, as much as possible grandma or their child, unvaccinated child. Um, I want to hang out with them. But with you, you can choose what you do. Unfortunately, that's, those are those have significant consequences to me and my community. I have, can also have the freedom to step away and be away from you. And that's the, the, the conversations that need to have. These are conversations. And hopefully you get to a point where you all agree. And then they get to a point where it's like, you know what? I want to do it because you know it's a worthy, quote unquote, sacrifice I can do for my family and my loved ones because I want to do everything possible. I don't want grandma to die. I want grandma to live long enough to see me graduate or get a new job or get married. And therefore, if I have to get vaccinated to see, ensure grandma is going to be okay, then so be it. You know, regardless of that's what we do these things, you know, to be part of society, you know, otherwise don't pay your taxes. Right. You know, you know, who, who, who loves paying their taxes? If you don't want to pay your taxes, don't pay your taxes. Because a lot of the money goes to vaccine research and distribution. So, you know, that, that the attitude is, like, I also, also believe that you have to own up to your attitudes. If you say you're going to do something, then you got to own up to all of it. Like you got to be consistent. If I don't want to do it because you, you can't make me, then don't pay taxes because that supports vaccine research and distribution. Move to a different country. Right. You know, yeah, right. it's, 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 that's the fact of life. You drive with however you, fast as you want without wearing a seatbelt while drunk te texting. If that's the attitude of like, well, you can't force me to do whatever you want. That's, you know, don't, don't go to school. Don't send people to school. Right. It, don't pay your taxes, I think, is the best argument. Yeah. And yeah, because that's definitely something none of us really want to do, but we have to. And, you have to. And, and, and even, you know, it's interesting. That's a social contract. Yeah, it is a social. Exactly. The social contract. I really like that you said that because it is a social contract. I feel that. Um, you know, even when you bring up Forrest Gump, you know, that was during a time of polio or, you know, polio was eradicated as a result of people all working together. This social contract that I do care about you. I may not know you, but I care enough about you to not want to be a reason you die. And unfortunately, over the pandemic, that happened a lot like that happened within. You know, I, I kept remember reminding my husband, I said, don't think that somebody just because you love me. You can't give me COVID and I can't die from it. Like you caring about me makes no difference to unfortunately the threat of what dis infectious diseases can do. Um, there's a part of what you had just said. It got me, you know, I, I want to ask because there's people who have concerns about side effects, um, legitimate side effects of, of immediate autonomous reactions to the vaccine. What is your suggestion if I happen to be a person who's like, okay, 
you know, I really want to take it, but I'm a bit nervous. Even my doctor is nervous. You know, I have allergies or, you know, I have a certain, I, I do know of a woman who, who claimed to have a, a particular blood disorder that when she got the vaccine, it made her susceptible to strokes. So what is your advice to somebody who is concerned about their reaction to getting the vaccination? Should they finally move forward and do it? I mean, do we force everyone to get rabies vaccines, even though we live with pets and animals? I mean, do we force everyone to get the Ebola vaccine uh, because Ebola can kill? Uh, Ebola is in a specific region of the world that most of us will never, ever visit. I mean, maybe I will, but, you know, until I go there, I will not get vaccinated with Ebola until I need it. Uh, the pets, you know, I'm not a veterinarian, so I'm not going to get a rabies vaccine until I get bitten by a vancoon, raccoon or there's a bat in my room, or I become a veterinarian. So that's why we vaccinate. It's the fact that your the risk assessment is that will you be exposed? You do not have that luxury with COVID. It's here. It's in your face. It's in your doorstep. It's everywhere. Unless you literally stay home and don't have any friends or move to a deserted island, COVID is here. It, t- technically, Ebola is here and bats are everywhere. So then you do get vaccinated for Ebola. You do get vaccinated for rabies if we have a bat outbreak and it's everywhere as much as COVID is. And guess what? COVID's in the air. It's way more infectious now with Omicron. Would you then prefer the side effects of catching COVID with your bloodborne disease? Or would you rather have the side effects of the vaccine, which right now we know kills far fewer people than seatbelts and airbags. So you might as well be concerned about the side effects of seatbelts, which causes intra-abdominal injury and strangulation and sometimes decapitation, or airbags that literally has a photo as you get into the car that it can kill babies if you put them in the front seat on a child seat. <laughs> like there's a side effect. Uh, and yet we still turn on our air, we still don't get in the car without airbags. So if you're gonna go by that logic, I'm concerned about the side effects of the vaccine. That is legitimate and fair. And I have to respect that in the same way that now you have to respect the fact you have to own up to the decision of being wary and cons- you know concerned of stepping to a car that has seatbelts or the, a car that has airbags or the fact that you know you are okay with the side effects of catching COVID, which are far worse. The myocarditis associated with COVID, the bloodborne clots that are associated with COVID, it's 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 way higher than anything associated with any vaccine, especially the mRNA vaccine, which is even far down. Like it's, it's the opposite ends of the spectrum. So if, we, if COVID was confined to a certain region of the world where it's never gonna reach our doorstep, then this will be a moot discussion. I wouldn't get vaccinated for fun if I'm never gonna go to West Africa uh, to be exposed to Ebola. Right. But until, you know, I, I might go to West Africa soon and I might consider the vaccine if I'm going to an area that has high you know, rates of Ebola. So that's the risk assessment. We don't pull on bulletproof vests unless there are troops running down the street and it's a hostile takeover. Sure. So because bulletproof vests are heavy and it's not something fun to wear around all the time. But if I see troops and tanks running down the street from a foreign enemy, I will put on bulletproof vests. You know, that's, but that's what COVID is. COVID is an invisible enemy rolling down our streets and infecting everyone. So you might as well start pulling on putting on that bulletproof vest, which may not prevent you from getting shot. In fact, when you get shot wearing a bulletproof vest, it's going to hurt really bad. You might be even saying take, be taken to the hospital. Bulletproof vests don't prevent you from getting shot or being prevented from taking to the hospital. But you're more likely to not get hospitalized. You're more likely to not get disabled from that bullet. You're more likely to not die. And you're more likely to go home after that hospital checkup. Yeah. So would you suggest them, the people that do have concerns to just do it in a more controlled setting? Like I, I, I'm not going to lie. I did get mine in the LA city through LA. It was in a parking garage by USC. You know, they, they're like, sit over here for 15 minutes. And if you're fine, just, you know, walk off. I mean, would you say then that that person, if they really have those concerns and, and that they should just do it in a more controlled setting, make sure you're at a clinic, make sure you're with your doctor, things like that. It's not about what you do, but how you do it. Everything can be have a caveat. You know, it's just like, it's, you know, you, you don't know unless you ask for it. Yeah, don't just get the vaccine. That's the what, but how are you going to get the vaccine? You can always ask to be monitored. I mean, I don't actually know of any vaccine site when I got vaccinated for all my three doses uh, where I wasn't monitored. In fact, I was like, can I go? Like, no, you can't. I need to monitor you. And I'm like, oh, fine. Like, and I go out of my social media and that's when I posted. Like, I, I mean, that's another qu- answer to your question. Why did I post? Because I was waiting for 15 to 20 minutes. I was really, really bored and I read all the news by that point. You know, might as well just post. I got vaccinated because it helped pass the time. So, 
that, that, you know, that's, I don't know, a place where you won't get monitored. And more often than not, like people get frustrated that they have to be monitored. So if you're the type to be on the concern side, guess what? We love doing that for you. We love monitoring you. Uh, so please ask your doctor for those options. They will arrange things where you can get monitored for 15 minutes to up to an hour to six hours to observation stay in the hospital, um, where, you know, you can be surrounded by clinicians, nurses, doctors, PAs, MPs to be able to take care of you in case anything bad happens. You know, or you ask for a doctor for a, a, you know, for the flu vaccine. There are also formulations that don't have egg in it. If you have an egg allergy, like it, people don't know unless they ask for it. So it's amazing what is capable when humans communicate uh, rather than just assume things without even talking about it. Right, right. I love, I love that you say that. That's absolutely true. Close mouth, don't get fed. So, and I mean, look, I know you say that about your posting, but I'm sure a lot of people in seeing you, especially because you are one of the first in the country to to go because you're in New York and you're working with patients. Uh, I'm sure, though, that the response for other people, whether they acknowledged it or not, was a bit of um, comfort and and inspiration. If, if he's doing it and look, he's doing a push up while he, you know, he's, he's doing all these things then I'm sure it did offer a sense of release for some people out there. And, and that, that makes a difference. As we, you, you know, we're right now, especially in Los Angeles, it's very interesting because, you know, we have a lot of, while well, our firehouses are not shutting down, we have a lot of third party, the ambulance, uh, uh, the tow truck companies, a lot of the third party contractors or, or pieces of response teams, what we or, are, you know, they're, People are losing their jobs because they're getting vaccinated uh, or excuse me, fa refuse to get vaccinated. We're now having police officers, we're having fire department personnel choose to not be vaccinated. How I and mean, this is just this is a personal opinion, of course, because, you know, you've gotten vaccinated. How important is it? To, do you feel like when a patient, when you step into an encounter with a patient, how impor important do you feel that it is that a patient feels safe? At least they know you've tried, you're taking every measure to protect yourself and them in the process. When it comes to this conversation with some uh, frontline workers, response team workers that refuse to take the vaccination, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I swore an oath. Uh, there's something called the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. So I don't want to do any harm to my patient to the best of my ability. And that's part of it is getting vaccinated. If you get vaccinated, you have a much lower viral load if in case you do get infected. It's remember, it's not about what, it's about how. So yeah, you can still get infected just the way you can still get into a car accident while wearing a seatbelt. But if you're not wearing a seatbelt and you get into a car accident, you're more likely to get shot out of the windshield, break your head as you go through and hit somebody else or go into the other car uh, and kill grandma crossing the street. You know, you might end up in the middle of the driveway because you're not wearing a seatbelt. And then a car flips over because your body's in the middle of the driveway because you're not wearing a seatbelt. So that's the same thing getting vaccinated. Yeah, you can still get infected, but your viral load and exposure to other people is much, much lower. The viral dose to other people is much, much lower. So I want my patient to feel as safe as possible by, because I'm fully vaccinated. Even if I were infected, I didn't know because you could be testing negative for 14 days until you're positive. You can be contagious for 18 days and be asymptomatic. You don't know. Like we do our best. We test them. We are negative. We have to go to work. I don't want the hospital to shut down. So I want the patient to know that even if I were, God forbid, to be infected despite a negative test and no symptoms, I'm not going to give COVID because I'm also wearing a mask and doing my best as perfectly as possible, even they not need be perfect enough. We know that we did our best. Now, if you are a frontline worker as a as a cop or as a firefighter, you're you know you created committed you. I don't know what oaths you swear to that's similar to the Hippocratic oath, but you can you know kind of want to help society. It's a civil service. We pay our taxes uh, so that you can you know do your job and you know you know, feed your family, you know, you wouldn't be very good as a frontline uh, service member if you go home to take care of somebody or responding to a call and then kill them with COVID. Right. Yeah. Or you go to put out someone's fire and then you, they thank you. And then you end up killing them with COVID. <laughs> That's an empty house, an empty yeah. burnt house. Um, it's not, it's not very, you're not doing, I mean, you, I guess you saved the house, but you didn't save the people. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what we're paying our taxes for uh, if, if you're doing your job and then you end up killing everyone with COVID or increasing your chances of killing everyone with COVID. Uh, I know the intentions aren't bad. I'm not I'm sure you're not going to kill people with COVID, but we only judge others by their behaviors and only ourselves by our intentions. Everyone has the best of intentions, but if you ran over my foot unintentionally, you're going to have to pay for it. Right. All right. right. I'm, 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 you're going to have to own up to why you ran over my foot. 
Uh, and when you end up responding to a call as a cop or a firefighter to a 911 call and you kill them with COVID, despite doing your job with the house or, you know, the, 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 whatever domestic disturbance or whatever right. it is, right. you end up infecting with COVID and they die or you die. You're not, you both of you are not doing very much work in being part of this society. That's not a very good social contract. Right. And, and it's important because, you know, it's interesting. There's an example that's fresh in my mind. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the story that, uh, um, I think his name is Rogelio uh, Medeiros he, Aguilar uh, Medeiros. I'm, I know I'm mispronouncing his last name. Forgive me, audience. But it, it, if you're familiar with the story, he was driving a big rig. Uh, the brakes went out the road. Unfortunately, though he was not under the influence, though he wasn't reacting recklessly, this young man was given 110 years in prison because with you know because of one just the way the statutes are in Colorado and um, because some people four people inadvertently were killed but in an accident a true accident you know and yet he's being held responsible I mean the vaccines we know how people I mean really at the end of the day right this moment who are the people who should be concerned the most the vaccinated or the unvaccinated the people who don't have working seatbelts and could have bad brakes and on top of that no working airbags you know, you can't control for the uncontrollable, but at least you want to know you did your best. And these things are not entirely preventable. So it's not just being infected and being hospitalized and having severe symptoms, disability and death when you're unvaccinated, where the chances are higher for the unvaccinated, but also lying in that hospital bed and knowing that you could have prevented it. Mm -hmm. You could have done just a little more to know that you didn't have to be in the hospital bed that day, that moment, and you could actually be traveling and living your best life on a beach somewhere, but you can't anymore because you're now in a hospital bed. It's a situation you could have entirely avoided by getting vaccinated. Have you seen that? <laughs> have you seen I this? Mean, and no, no, even then, like you're getting monoclonal antibodies, which are running out, by the way, in New York City. They're $30,000. They're $30,000, not because of the monoclonal antibodies, but because you have to pay for the observation save, the hospital save, the, the IV, the, the, the monitoring, the nurses, the staffing, the doctor that checks in on you, the, the, just using right. hospital resources. That costs $30,000. When you, you're getting a treatment, basically you're getting someone else's antibodies who either recovered or got vaccinated for COVID at this point, right? All the donors right. are mostly vaccinated. Uh, so you're pretty much getting a vaccine antibodies from someone else, paying $30,000 for it. Well, you could entirely avoid that by getting a vaccine for free. Sure. And making money about it. Sure. That's, that's it's, and, and one of the last things, I know we only have a few more minutes, but I kind of want to say, you know, people also, one of the, this just came out. We're all being guinea pigs. Our, our mna vaccines have been around and being in development. This, this, this vaccine itself has been in development for at least 10 years, right? Um, 50. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the mRNAs. Absolutely. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to ask you a personal question. You've mm -hmm. had the vaccine. You've had the boosters. Dr. Calvin Sun, what has been your personal side effects to this vaccine? Living my best life, traveling the world. I've been to every, uh, like, I think I've hit every country in Europe uh, by June. Um, I, I've traveled to a new, two new countries on average, three new countries every month since May. And it's been seven months now. I've traveled consistently every three weeks. The only trips that have been canceled had nothing to do with COVID. Uh, it was more like a coup that was going on. So I quickly changed to another country that took me in. I uh, put through a weekend trip with seven other strangers, met countless amazing friends. Uh, what are the side effects? Uh, made, you know, have amazing serendipities every month and every trip. Um, I mean, it's just like my life's been pretty damn good. Uh, I mean, that's a that's a pretty serious side effect, I think, <laughs> just to like be so happy and relieved, and I don't have to worry. And every new uh, news article that comes out about this new variant, I'm like reassured, like, oh yeah, and, like you know, it's, I'm boosted. I'm in the best possible position. Uh, rather, you know, ever feeling, you know, the what was could have been the other the the opposite. If I were not vaccinated, every news article would freak me out. It's like, man, I wish I got the iPhone, but now everyone's emailing everyone on their phones and I still have to like log on my 56 dial up modem because I'm kind of like unsure about this new technology called, you know, Wi-Fi. Right. right? So, right. you know, I, I'm the first in line to get the new iPhone. I've never regretted it. <laughs> I've been taking amazing, like great photos. I love the new camera. My, the speed is faster. My battery life is longer. Every year I'm always want to be ahead of the curve. Uh, and I haven't regretted a single iPhone purchase, even with all the bugs. 
uh, you know, there were more bugs in an I Apple iPhone on the first purchase than there are in a vaccine. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So I'm in that case, <laughs> those of you who are worried about the side effects, don't buy anything. Right, don't, just right. Don't buy anything. Just stick to your radio. I know. Actually, I don't even know radio signals, radio waves. I'm kind of concerned about. I those. know. You know, using your cell phone. Years. I used to. This is this is true. I used. You know, I anybody can. I used to be an owner with Metro PCS. I was one of the original dealers. My ex husband and I had thirty stores. Let me tell you something. I learned. Don't put your phone up to your head. Don't I always uh, use earphones? Don't, don't listen to the radio. Right? It's only you know, technology has been around since what 80, 90. It's only 30 years more than the mRNA yeah. vaccines. 30 years is nothing. Memory means have been 50 years. Radios have been what 80, 90 years. I mean, electric cars, Teslas. I don't know about those. You know, they've been around as just as long as the mRNA vaccines. Yeah. Even though they're better for the environment. And if you shoot it at a Tesla in the war zone, like as if it was COVID driving through all these bullets, Teslas don't explode like a gasoline power car. But, you know, gasoline power cars have been around for longer. So maybe that's more still trustworthy in a war zone. Right. Um, because it still might blow up in your face if you shoot at the gas tank. But the Teslas, you know, near new technology, electric cars, should what gas tank? And yeah, it's the most popular car. So it's very interesting. You're very right. Like, this is the part that stresses me out. Not stresses me, but I'm trying to, like, show everyone. You see, we're always constantly, you know, it, it, we're always constantly evolving and doing new things and learning and growing. And it's, But it's interesting to see the resistance. I, to finish my story earlier, I was resistant. I was nervous to get it. I'm not going to not admit to you that I wasn't. But once I got it, I can't lie. I did experience a sense of relief. Suddenly, I, you know, and I felt fine. I didn't, people had me psyched out for the second one. You know what I did? I'll be totally honest. And I want my audience to, I told myself, you know what? Because we, we, we live by a certain uh, spiritual laws. I'm, I, I know. I see you, Dr. Sun. I get it. You know, I Learned told myself. Synchronicity. Yep. And I told myself, even if I feel bad, I feel fine. And I felt fine. I really, truly did. I, I had, you know, a little sore arm. And the second time everyone was, you know, freaking me out, I felt fine. And then like you, I've been able to go to Art Basel. I've gone to New York. I went to Vegas. We went to Italy and stood on the red carpet with my husband's film. Couldn't do those things if I wasn't vaccinated. So I do understand that for me, my personal, it was a, a definitely uh, an, an enlightening uh, experience really quick uh, we only have three more minutes but I do want to say from a personal perspective for you um, what is your you know with the holidays coming up observations people should be taking like for example I have a I'm my we're all vaccinated but my five-year-old's not right so I feel I do still have to um, exercise care and caution travels coming up what are the top three things that you feel people should do over the holidays to just maybe keep safer for themselves their family and our communities Assess your circumstances and context. So, you know, if grandma is living with you or you have an immunocompromised family member, or you have a child that's unvaccinated, that circumstance is pretty much the decision maker. I would say make the decision based on the most vulnerable person in your household. So for those, maybe consider not traveling. Enjoy the holidays at home. Uh, being away from Omicron is best as your ability because you don't want to know that you did your best. You do want to know that you, you did not bring this, or you did your best ability not to bring it home. And even if you did, or it did end up getting into your home, whether someone's visiting or you know, flew in with the dog, or you know, that ends up in your home, it's not your fault uh, because you did your you did as uh, as much as you could. You can't prevent car accidents sometimes. You can't prevent natural disasters even when you had all the seatbelts on and airbags on and wearing a helmet. Um, so that's my first one, just who was the most vulnerable and make your decisions about them. If you are going to take a risk, you know, risk assessment, risk tolerance, uh, and calculated risk, I feel very comfortable having you go to a fully vaccinated place like, you know, midtown Manhattan, if you're coming from, you know, somewhere domestically, then you would to a place where that's doesn't believe in COVID, doesn't believe in face coverings, or doesn't believe in the vaccine. That's much more dangerous. Uh, so just, you know, calculate a risk of where you go, how you go. Uh, you know, sometimes it's nice to take an empty flight at six o'clock in the morning than a packed flight uh, where there's babies crying everywhere. And, you know, that's just in general before pandemic uh, in mid afternoon. So, and then, and then finally, the third thing is, you know, face coverings do, it's, it's just, it's not a light switch. It's not like you wear a face covering, you're never gonna get it. It's just like a seatbelt, it, it's, it's, it's a tool. Uh, and you want to know that you used it not only for yourself, but also for the respect of your fellow person and your community members. Uh, face masks are important, but also it's just an additive thing. It's not going to be a game changer. Um, so you might as well just do it because every little bit counts. But on top of that, do everything outside. Social uh, gatherings, um, if you can keep it outside uh, and apart and not like a nightclub or a Coachella festival, then it's very hard to spread COVID that way. 
and we do both of them, you really can actually have a normal holiday season despite a pandemic. To have everything outside with your cup of hot cocoa and your face coverings when you're not drinking it and, you know, scattered outside with good music and cheer. I mean, things are just more fun outside. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they, some people say, well, it's too cold. The weather is too cold. I don't like it. Well, that was my first recommendation. Stay indoors. Don't go out yeah. at all. You can have both. Uh, so That's what you told I me. I literally just gave you a win-win-win <laughs> situation by giving all three guidelines. It really is. And you did. And you told me and you made, you know, during protests, you said, stay outside, Alia. And you know what? And, and to this day, I, I, to my knowledge, I have not gotten COVID yet. And so I from the Black Lives Matter protests yeah, yeah, in May, yeah, yeah. none of them got COVID. Exactly. The way that indoors and indoor gatherings have. And that's when we knew COVID does not spread as well as outdoors. Thank to the BLM protests, we were yep. able to get back to our normal lives. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah, that's a good sooner. point. Yeah. Well, We're thank sitting. you so much for being with us again. We got to run, but I always appreciate you. Love your energy, your spirit. Keep inspiring and doing all that you do. And thank you for being with us today. We look forward thank to seeing you. you in 2022. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. Thank you. And to everyone else at home, man, I, I hope you got something out of that. And, and you know what? Look, at the end of the day, just don't be afraid. If you, you know, if you have concerns, talk to your physician, but do not be afraid to get the vaccination. That is my vote. OK, so until next time, thanks for letting us be unsugarcoated. Take care. Bye. What are you still doing here? Come back next week.